notification um, to say that, uh, that we're recording. So we've got uh, two speakers with us today. Um, I'll introduce both of them. They'll run through presentations and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Feel free to also use questions in the chat area, um, but whilst presenting, Joe and Keith won't be able to, to open that chat and see it because they'll have their screens shared. So uh, we'll go with Joe first. So Professor Joe Howe um, has extensive experience working interchangeably with industry on major environmental projects and initiatives across the UK, is proactively engaged with the emerging clean growth agenda and has roles on various advisory boards um, and projects, most notably the UK Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre and the Northwest Hydrogen Alliance. I'll just introduce Keith as well, uh, but we'll go to Joe first. So Keith Owen is Head of Systems Development and Energy Strategy at Northern Gas Networks with areas of interest aligned to identification of new and existing technologies to progress the transition to low carbon gas infrastructure and support net zero targets to 2050. He's responsible for research across a range of themes such as digital heat transport, customer vulnerability and whole systems, and is involved in research with the universities across the Northeast, um, but also has responsibility for some national initiatives like the iGEM Hydrogen Committee. So I'll hand over to Joe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I've been asked to pull together a short presentation this afternoon around some of the work that I've been doing on hydrogen, particularly in the Northwest, but I could talk about more uh, national and global issues too through questions, should you wish. I'll try and hint at some of those things as I go through my presentation. So without further ado, I'll try and share my screen. Rhiannon and Sarah tell me if it's sharing. Let's see if I can find it again. Let's go for that one there. Is that okay? Is that sharing okay, colleagues? Yeah, fabulous. So colleagues, this, this is where I work. I work at the heart of the South Mersey Industrial Cluster. If you look at this in front of you, you can see the River Mersey. And just to the north of the River Mersey, you can see Liverpool Airport. To the south of the River Mersey, you can see the Manchester Ship Canal. On the left-hand side, just above Cogen, you've got uh, Eastern Dock. That's where uh, the crude oil that comes into Stanlow Oil Refinery, the SR Oil UK facility, which is in the middle, down at the bottom uh, of this slide. On the left-hand side, you've got a company called Eurenco, which is the largest uranium enrichment facility in the UK. Just above that, you've got Vauxhall, a major car plant in the UK. Uh, just to the right of Ellesmere Port, you've got Argent Energy, which is the largest biodiesel facility in the UK. Going uh, just to, further to the right or further to the east, you come to Thornton Science Park, which used to be the former Shell Research and Development Facility when they operated the oil refinery. That's where I'm based, so I work within the curtilage of an oil refinery. Uh, just to the east of that, you've got NSERC Glass. NSERC Glass have got major propositions around a hydrogen furnace to go in on that particular facility. You've then got shale gas wells that were owned by iGas, a former fertilizer facility, CF Fertilizers. And then going further to the east, you've got Rock Savage International with the six largest power plants in the UK. And just to the north of that, you've got Ineos Chlor, which is a major hydrogen user, Ineos Chlor Vinyls. Uh, and then Virador, the largest energy from waste facility in the UK. And then just to the south of all of this, you come to Northwich, Northwich with the largest onshore gas storage facilities with the salt cabins with propositions for, um, for uh, hydrogen storage there. Hopefully I can go on to the next slide. Let's hope I can. This might take some time actually, okay. There we go. This is the work that I'm currently involved in. Top left-hand side is the HiNet cluster. I'm the academic lead for the HiNet consortium. Mission Innovation, Mission Innovation Hydrogen was a breakthrough theme at last year's COP summit. Um, I'm the academic lead in the UK. The UK is leading on hydrogen production, and I advise the UK on hydrogen production technologies. IDRIC, Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, have a number of different projects uh, funded by IDRIC, some on hydrogen, some around skills, 
uh, some around uh, EDI, et cetera. Uh, further to the right, you come to the HEOS um, project that I've got, which is a metal hydrides project, looking at metal hydrides as a hydrogen store. Um, bottom left-hand side is the Northwest Hydrogen Alliance. I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail. I've then put, I've put the hydrogen strategy in there. Chapter three of the hydrogen strategy goes into the research and innovation uh, aspects and skills and supply chain capacity aspects. I drafted quite a lot of that. Thankfully, I had a fabulous civil, fabulous civil servants that I worked with and turned my science into, into a really lovely narrative, which is beautiful. Uh, chapter three, subsequently after that, subsequently after that, we've produced a number of different working papers or working notes with the research and innovation uh, um, timeline and framework, but also the supply chain capacity and capability uh, working paper that we've published. Next is National Grid and uh, National Grid Project Union, which I'm involved in. I'm the academic advisor to National Grid on their the future gas program and their future markets program with, um, with, uh, with Project Union um, being a grid ready network, supposedly ready for, to be operational, particularly in the east of England by 2030. And then we've got the Northwest Hydrogen Alliance, a body that I, that I chair, which I'll come on to in a little while. If I get onto the next slide, the Northwest Hydrogen Alliance. So the Northwest Hydrogen Alliance is an industry body which uh, industry for some reason have asked me to chair. It brings together about 35 different companies from across the Northwest, a couple of universities, um, hydrogen uh, production companies, distribution companies, uh, plants that consume hydrogen, innovation companies, um, companies that, uh, that, uh, distribute, uh, that, that uh, distribute hydrogen, uh, and a lot of um, a lot of companies concerned with the engineering construction sector. Uh, I am very much involved in in the, in the whole oh and power companies as well, such as uh, Unipa. I am very much involved in the engineering construction sector in the UK. Um, I chair something called the uh, Engineering Construction Industry Training Board Skills and Qualifications uh, Committee in the UK. There's also a couple of um, there's also a couple of uh, nuclear companies on here. We're very interested in the notion of pink hydrogen. I hate using the term colours of hydrogen. What I'm particularly passionate is a low carbon hydrogen standard that I've been working with Bayes on, and ensuring that we meet that particular standard in in the production and consumption of any hydrogen uh, um, any hydrogen that we uh, are involved in within the within the northwest of England. Oh, for some reason. For some reason, let me see if I can find that again. Is that back? Yeah, fabulous. Let's start again then. I don't know why I'm having problems. So let's see if I can go on to the next slide. Can I go on to the next slide? Yeah, so there we go. So Project Union colleagues, I'm sure you're aware of this. This is National Grid's proposition for a, uh, for a hydrogen network transmission system to be operational, start to be operational by uh, 2030. You can see broadly the pattern that it follows. It follows the existing sort of uh, uh, geography of National Grid. There are pipelines all over the country. The proposition here is to take one pipeline, one part of National Grid, and actually ensure that it's hydrogen ready by 2030. You can see that principally Project Union is about linking the industrial clusters. On here, you've got the industrial clusters that were identified in the industrial clusters mission and in the industrial decarbonisation challenge. But also on here, I think you're getting a good hint about the various clusters that might emerge should uh, should some kind of invitation for track two clusters get announced potentially as early as Thursday of, of this week, uh, should uh, should Graham Smith make some significant announcements around hydrogen carbon capture and clusters. Um, next slide, if I can find it, there we go. What I really wanted to focus on today, because it's probably of interest to most people, is the high net consortium and the high net proposition. The high net proposition is a track one cluster. It pulls together what well, its core focus is around carbon capture, carbon transport, carbon storage. And I do think there'll be announcements around that on Thursday. But it's also around hydrogen production, distribution and consumption uh, as well. So here we go. This is what high nets is all is all about. We anticipate that, uh, to be honest with you, we will be operational by 2027. Now, looking at the business models, 
uh, and looking at the legislative framework, I think when this slide was pulled together, we were expecting it to be operational by the end of 2025. But I think hopefully with positive announcements this week, it will be 2027. We currently have a development consent order in for infrastructure uh, associated with carbon, and we're out for consultation uh, with the uh, with the hydrogen aspects to that particular uh, project. We will be utilizing a lot of existing infrastructure, but we will be uh, building new infrastructure as well associated with it. We will have a hydrogen storage facility at the salt caverns, which will be overseen by uh, Innovern and Store Energy. And there will be a, a number of different facilities put in place, not least a major uh, hydrogen production facilities that will go on Stanley Oil Refinery. There's a picture of that on the right hand side of the slide as you look at it, but I might come back to that in a little while. Um, what we're expecting, or what I'm hoping on Thursday, is that uh, uh, the, the government will announce which of the key aspects of Track 1 Phase 2 the government will support with various revenues, incentives, as well as with uh, various uh, components offered up by industry within the Northwest. The uh, six key um, aspects to the track one phase two um, uh, components is on the left hand side here. Vertex hydrogen is the key one in terms of the hydrogen production aspects, and that will go on the on onto the uh, Stanlow uh, oil refinery. The others on there are all associated with all associated with the carbon capture, transport, and storage elements of the of the uh, of the of the uh, uh, high net uh, proposition. Uh, about six or seven months ago, we had our first major hydrogen boiler delivered to uh, Stanley Oil Refinery. This is now in well, it's now virtually in place. It will need to be linked to the hydrogen production plant, which will go on to, onto the oil refinery. The hydrogen production plant, if you look at Cheshire Western Chester, you can find on their planning portal all the details around that hydrogen production uh, facility. It is Johnson Matty technology, uh, and that's currently uh, got a planning application in associated with that hydrogen production facility. There will be a, a hydrogen pipeline. Uh, which currently has a development consent order in, which will be operated by Cadent Gas. That will run um, in an easterly direction towards Manchester Airport and in a westerly direction towards a place called Burton Point, which I'll talk about in a little uh, while. Subsequently, there has been an announcement by a glass company in the area. I mentioned NSERC Glass earlier before, and they're also in the process of procuring a hydrogen furnace for their glass bottle making uh, facility, which is about two miles to the two miles to the east of Stanlow Oil Refinery. You don't need to know that. You know all about the climate uh, and ecological emergency. This is quite an interesting slide, though, for you. So, what you can see there is where we were before with the with the um, with the Mersey Estuary. Right in the centre of that slide, you'll see an orange uh, grey sort of circle. That's where the major hydrogen production facilities will go. The orange the orange pipeline on there is then the carbon capture, transport, and then storage facility out to the East Irish Sea of the carbon that will be captured from the uh, hydrogen facility but also from a whole series of other industries, some of which I outlined before, are those that are the track one, phase two uh, components. On here too, you can see the salt cabins, which are located at Northwich. You can see the pipelines going over towards Manchester Airport. You can see the pipelines then going north uh, towards St. Helens, St. Helens, Pilkington Glass, they already have uh, uh, propositions for a hydrogen facility there, and we will be supplying or they will be supplying hydrogen in the imminent future to Liverpool city region to run a fleet of buses of hydrogen in that particular locality. The hydrogen then will go out towards the east with propositions around uh, hydrogen for uh, cement manufacturing over on, on the eastern side. There's a whole series of propositions then going to the north towards major food and drink manufacturers, which are located, oh, between St. Helens and let's say uh, Preston. Um, some of those 
it will be announced, have received funding from the uh, from the net zero high here in fund to do feed, post feed, and even uh, semi construction. Um, over the course of the next few weeks, we'll hear more about those particular aspects. There's also a proposition for Liverpool Port. Liverpool Port is operated by Peel. You may have seen well, last week Peel Ports announced that they they're going to develop. A, um, a an import facility for ammonia, which will go at Eastern Dock, which I mentioned before. That's what currently where the crude oil comes in. Ammonia, liquid ammonia will come in there and also feed into the oil refinery to be processed. That's likely to be greener. I don't like the colors. It'll also be low carbon, but it's likely to be greener perhaps than the bluer stuff that will be produced on the oil refinery. Hynet Consortium, this is the various groups and parties involved in the Hynet Consortium, um, of which you can see the University of Chester is one of them. Um, Cadent, the gas distribution network operator, is a key par partner. They've secured funding from the, uh, the Ofgen Rio Revenues and Incentives Initiative to build the hydrogen pipeline. That development consent order is in at the moment for that particular pipeline that will link the salt caverns, the hydrogen production facilities and their major gas distribution network. That gas will be blended into that network and you never know again on Thursday, we might hear some announcements about hydrogen blending. We rather hope so because the government's taking some time to announce uh, this decision and companies are investing heavily into the fact that hydrogen blending will come along in a not too distant future. This is what the hydrogen would be used for. Well, this is the whole hydrogen uh, system, because I know I'm talking to the hydrogen systems group. We've got production, distribution, storage, fuel switching propositions, import propositions, blended, blending. And then we have the hydrogen village, of course, which Caden at the moment has uh, been blessed with. I'll use that term, blessed with in terms of a Whitby. And it's not Whitby over on the other side of the Pennines, it's Whitby and Ellesmere Port which has been designated as uh, potentially uh, the first uh, hydrogen village. The other location on the other side of the Pennines is, uh, is over at Redcar. Who knows if either of those will get the public consent to operate. I think there's a lot of work for us to do, colleagues, on the issue of consent around hydrogen. And that's something that I would love to work with you on to ensure that we get that to, to get that consent. Um, I think there's an issue here also around power. I think the, we have three major gas cycle turbine plants in the area. One that I've already mentioned over at Runcorn. We have one, the Uniper facility you can see on here, the future power generation plant uh, based at uh, Connors Quay. And then we have one over towards Manchester Airport, uh, which is operated by Carlton Power. I think between them, they're the fifth, sixth and seventh largest combined gas cycle plants in the UK. We also have considerable electrolytic hydrogen production capability in this area. You can see the hydrogen production facility uh, uh, on this slide, that's on Stanley Oil Refinery. Just to the east of there, we have the INEOS facility. They're already generating 20 megawatts of electrolytic hydrogen on that particular, uh, that particular site, and they have ambitions to grow that substantially. Also on this slide, you can see the notion of hydrogen trains in Witness, which is just across the River Mersey. From Runcorn, we have Alstom, and they have propositions to uh, to repurpose and potentially to repurpose uh, diesel stock within the north of England and potentially even build uh, a breeze on that in that particular facility. It's hydrogen breeze, their their hydrogen train, and that sure. looks like it's it for the time being. Lovely. Thank you very much, Joe. There's some questions in the chat that we'll come to at the end of the Q&A, but I'll ask you to stop the screen share and we'll hand the floor over to Keith. Yes, of course. Uh, you are sharing your screen now. How do I stop that? I don't know. I'm going to stop it because it doesn't tell me. There we go. I can stop share. There we go. That's Thanks. fabulous. Over Thank to you, you Keith. Keith. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I, I fear that um, some of this will sound very similar to uh, to Joe's talk, but uh, I'll try and put some differentiators in there. Uh, so afternoon, everyone. Uh, Keith Owen, Head of Systems Development for, for Northern Gas Networks. We're the gas distribution business in the north of England. Um, and we've been working on this hydrogen 
story for, for quite some time. 2015, there or thereabouts, we, we started to look into this. Um, and it's important that we do that in order to understand how we support the UK's ambition for net zero. Um, so what I've got is a, is a bunch of slides here. I'll, I'll, I'll rattle through them, welcome questions, obviously, uh, as the, when we get to the end. Um, and hopefully it gives you a sense of the, the joined up thinking that um, links into everything that you've heard from Joe, because this is not you know, the Gas Networks project. Uh, it's not a, uh, a Caden project, if you like. This is a national endeavor to understand the role of hydrogen on a, in our energy system. Very much from my perspective, at least from a whole systems point of view, um, because we need every tool in the box to uh, combat this climate change monster we're dealing with. Um, so hopefully uh, you can see the slides and I'll, I'll kick on from, from there. So let me just, yeah, so so why are we doing it? Uh, so I'm sure this is quite familiar to a lot of you, um, but, but it's important context because without uh, policy steer strategy from central government, none of this really happens. Um, industry, uh, need this as much as uh, academia need this in terms of certainty uh, to invest, certainty to undertake research and so forth, uh, that we're pointing in the direction government need us to, to point in. So these documents, uh, whilst dry on the screen, are really important documents in the context of climate change and how we progress the role of uh, hydrogen, how we decarbonize our energy system, which is vast. Uh, and provides that significant framework for our economy, our business, our industries uh, to, to flourish, uh, be competitive, and it's how, it how it underpins everything that, from a domestic perspective, we've grown to enjoy. Uh, we, we think not of switching the light on and the power being there. Uh, we, we think not that when the boiler switches on, it's gonna heat our homes, um, and that's a good place to be. And, and long may that continue. So these documents are really important and we need more. Uh, that policy certainty is really essential for supply chain investment and recruitment, developer skills uh, and so forth to deliver what is gonna be a fundamental transformation of everything that we know today uh, into a low carbon future. So it's really important that we have that context and, and support from central government right throughout all of this. Uh, in terms of what we've been doing, uh, so really, as I say, from quite a few years ago now, uh, we've been working predominantly through our H21 programme, which is a, a broad ranging piece of work covering all aspects of hydrogen that we might need to understand in the context of gas network, both from a gas distribution network through our H21 programme and then linking in with the work that our colleagues at National Gas Transmission get up to in those higher pressure systems. Uh, so really important that engaged work, that collaborative process. And you can see on that slide there, a number of different areas of key concern to, to understand the fundamental delta between what we do today with natural gas and what that may look like when we start to convey hydrogen through that exact same asset. Um, uh, and that work largely will close out summertime this year. Uh, as we as we, re, we uh, uh, unlock uh, final parts of phase two uh, and publicise that, so everyone gets a sense of uh, uh, what we've uncovered through that that uh, research and the evidence base that we've established, which is uh, uh, ratified, if for a better description, through our, our colleagues at the health and safety executives. So this is validated work. We're not just spitting something out without um, having a proper third party scrutiny of the, of the work that peer review is absolutely essential. Um, so that's a good bit of background, I think, to give you a sense of what we've been up to. You can see on there the images from, from site. We've got our uh, facility over in Buxton, which we did a lot of leakage work on, and our facility uh, in Spade Adam, which is just over in Cumbria there, working with colleagues from DNV and, and the other networks to understand how, as a system, uh, hydrogen will behave as we start to create a, a you know, future gas grid of, of, uh, of hydrogen transportation. So a lot of good work's happened there, a lot of really important documentation and evidence has been built up over the years. So where are we headed to with all of this? So a little while ago, uh, government instructed the networks to put forward proposals for uh, a hydrogen village trial, 
circa 2000 connections. Um, and where we got to with that, uh, ourselves uh, with Wales in the West and our colleagues over came put forward, and Scotia put forward uh, proposals for locations where that might happen. And you've heard about uh, the Whitby, the Northwest Whitby. Um, there is only one Whitby and it's on the East Coast, but we'll not go into that. Um, uh, but those two locations of Whitby and Redcar were uh, uh, shortlisted by government. And that's what they're busy looking at at the moment to decide which uh, will proceed forward to a, a full-scale trial. Uh, I've got some information on that, so I'll just drop to the next slide. This gives you a sense of what we've been up to there to, to understand how we do that, how we engage and so forth. So the, we've spent an awful lot of time working with the local community. We've got our uh, little hydrogen shop, for want of a better description, uh, down there, our engagement centre where members of the public can drop in at any time, have a conversation, express concerns, discuss the technology, discuss what evidence we've 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 been developing and so forth so they understand it and can uh, have a proper conversation about uh, all of that we're working really closely with the, the uh, local MPs councillors uh, local authority uh, and, and the regional mayor of course uh, to really understand what do we need to do uh, to get the information out there in, an, in a you know in a balanced uh, balanced view I suppose so that customers that are part of this trial, consumers that are part of this trial, feel engaged, feel they've got some buy-in to being part of that and can understand and support it, or indeed decide not to be part of it. So it's a really important piece of work uh, that goes on uh, whilst, whilst government decide which, which location uh, uh, may win. And it's fair to say that not everybody's a huge fan, right? Uh, it would be naive of anyone to think that that was the case. Uh, uh, broadly, it's been a very positive position, but we are aware of some who decide that for whatever reason, I suppose, that but it's not for them. And that, that's absolutely fine. Um, so we continue with this. Uh, I'll give you a sense of the scale of it. So that's the uh, general engagement. Uh, uh, in terms of time scales, uh, you can see that up on your screen now. Uh, so it shows you there's already a lot of work happened to date through 2021, 2022. Um, really next steps are, which is it? Is it going to be the Whitby trial or the red car trial? Uh, and then we'll proceed from there. Once we get that notification, uh, we'll then start that work in earnest uh, to deliver the project uh, to the time skills that you can see on the slide there uh, in the build up to something uh, um, hopefully much bigger uh, in future. This is a little representation of the, the location, it gives you a sense of what we're trying to do there. And I think it's important that the kind of three primary elements to delivering energy to a consumer is where is it coming from? How do you transport it and how is it consumed? Uh, and all of that is represented in this, in this slide in terms of the production, uh, what is the source of the hydrogen, um, green, blue, uh, whatever. Uh, and, and you can see some electrolysis is represented there. So we've got different sources of hydrogen as part of the plan. Uh, so we've got diversity of supply. We've got salt caverns. Uh, we've got high pressure bullets, all part of the high pressure storage vessels. Uh, pardon the <laughs> parochial terms. Uh, so high, high pressure above ground storage vessels to, to provide us the storage needed to satisfy the, uh, the demand cycle within the smart demand cycle of the uh, domestic load um, uh, and we've got pipelines and so on and so forth so you, you get a sense of how complex this can be uh, to understand and deliver the logistical change required so this is less of a, a demanding engineering research piece and much more about the logistical challenge of how do we get from A to B in a sequential manner in a way that is uh, appropriate for our, our customers that they understand what's going on and can be part of the overall story. So it's really important that we pull all that together uh, to deliver this piece of work for, for the UK government. Uh, and as I say, we wait with bated breath to find out who's who's the winner. Um, and no offence, Joe, but I hope it's us. <laughs> um, but what next? Uh, uh, doing 2000 con connections is all well and good. Uh, that gives us a sense of how do you do it, uh, what does it look like, uh, overcomes some of those 
logistics, as I say, but to really uh, bottom out the, the role of hydrogen in, in heat, you need something much larger. And what the government have asked the, the industry to do is propose uh, locations for a hydrogen town. So we've all been collaborating, working on that. And you can see three potential locations we've, we've put forward. Um, and I think it's important to really understand that scale up. Why go from 2,000 to 10,000 and so forth? And the key here is the challenge becomes much more pronounced uh, the higher up that demand curve you go. At 10,000 properties, you're really starting to see substantial production challenge, substantial storage challenge, uh, and the logistical effort of carrying out that conversion. So it's really important that you that test is applied to show what this looks like. Because if you're ever going to achieve a rollout of hydrogen on a national scale, this is the level of project required to demonstrate capability and to develop the skill sets, the supply chain. And I can't underestimate how challenging it would be to get supply chain to respond whilst we have no policy certainty. And, and that is the case at the moment. There are still uh, still awaiting him to, to deliver that policy certainty, I think, albeit that the government are incredibly supportive in what they're doing right here, right now. So it's useful to get that sense of this is where we are today. By 2025, we've got a, a hydrogen village, but not very far beyond that. We're really pushing towards a much, much larger project with some incredibly useful challenges in there for industry to pick up and run with. Um, do, does it phase us? Not, not in the least. Do we think we can do this? Absolutely. Um, this is kind of what industries such as mine do. Um, so, so we're quite confident that if we are green lit for this, uh, that the industry will pick this up and, and make it happen, because that's basically what we do. Um, so I think that's an interesting little uh, uh, stride through. Again, you get a sense of the effort that's already un been undertaken and where we're headed. I'll not read through that uh, uh, in, in detail. I'm sure you've probably glanced it through already because I'm talking. But it does give you a sense of where we're trying to get to with all of this uh, to deliver something by that 2030 and then support that wider rollout program should, should government choose that uh, direction of travel, that pathway. So how does all that hang together? Uh, well, this is absolutely in line with everything that Jules just said. Um, and absolutely in line with Project Union, which uh, he, he went through, and I was rather grateful because I don't, don't have a Project Union slide on my deck. Um, uh, all of that infrastructure that you can see, that blue snaking line that's running down uh, the East Coast, our East Coast Hydrogen Project, working with our colleagues at National and colleagues at, um, at Caden and so on, all of that would be an interconnector or connected into rather into that Project Union system. So you have that hydrogen backbone development being able, being capable of delivering huge amounts of product from A to B in the fast and efficient manner that you see today with, with natural gas. So it's an incredibly important piece of work that's being undertaken here to provide that interconnected highway um, for, for hydrogen as we develop into a low carbon economy. Uh, I'll not go into the detail of that course, but um, that gives you a sense of just how much opportunity, how much impact, and, and indeed the pace at which all of this really needs to move now because we've lost a great deal of time as a globally, we've lost a great deal of time in combating climate change. And it's such an important thing to get right that we've got to move quickly now to, to get this done because 2050 from an infrastructure perspective is, is kind of next week really. Um, so, so pace, impact, opportunity uh, are really important in all of this. Um, so what I've gone through there is a little bit around how we're developing our hydrogen program, how we established some initial evidence and so forth. But I just want to touch on um, how we still keep going throughout all of this with research. And here's a, a good old photograph from the 70s of uh, what would have been a, a British gas research station field site where they undertook all sorts of research back in the 70s as nationalized industry. Uh, but, but we know it's uh, in, in, as, as our Lothorny site or Integral site as we started calling it. And what we've done is uh, transform what was a, a historic 
um, uh, or legacy research facility and brought all of that back to life. Uh, so I'll go through some of the things we've been running from there very quickly. And this gives you a sense of the timeline that we've been developing it through working really closely with, with Sarah and team uh, uh, through SESI, developing our whole systems thinking initially and, and launching the, the, the site back in 2017. And over time, what we've been doing is securing funding and creating capability on the site across a wide range of different technologies to create quite a unique uh, sort of village cityscape, I suppose, uh, which is representative of an awful lot of what's in our, in our towns and cities. So it's moving away perhaps from the big industrial stuff to much more lower scale, but equally important challenges around decarbonisation. And I'm not going to the detail of that because I've got further slides on it. Um, so part of it, and you heard a little bit about blending there from, from Joe earlier, it's really important to understand how we've got to that position where we're waiting for government to decide if we want to do it. And that's down to the High Deploy project, which is a collaborative with our uh, colleagues at Cadent to really understand how far can we blend hydrogen in, volumetrically blend it in, um, before that might pose a, a problem for connected appliances. Uh, so that was a piece of work that was undertaken at our integral site, with the site. Um, you can see the kit there, uh, which was really successful, very supported by the community, and allowed us to establish the base case for and the evidence case for for blending in the UK. And that's moved to to the high net region now. And I think they're on high net three, uh, high deploy three, rather uh, busy working on that from a, a, a an industrial perspective. Uh, we launched our hydrogen homes uh, uh, a little over a year ago now, I think, uh, with, uh, again, working closely with Cadence and uh, what was Bayes at the time, now Desnes. Um, and this was demonstrating all of the appliances that Bayes developed through the high for heat program, so hydrogen boilers, hydrogen ready boilers, uh, two discrete types of technology there, uh, hydrogen cookers and fires and, and metering. Uh, so we've got them on display there, uh, full operation. They've been like that for feels like a good 18 months, perhaps now. Um, fully functioning, do exactly what you might expect of those types of appliances. And we've had thousands of guests come along to see what that looks like. So if anyone's interested in that, please do make contact and we can, we can set up a visit for you uh, to run through all of that. Uh, the next stages of all of this is, is our, our customer energy village. I'll just let those, that term, little animation run while I'm talking. And I'm conscious of the fact that there are millions of properties out there that have been in the ground for an awful long time. Um, they're pretty challenging in terms of insulation, pretty challenging from a retrofit perspective. So a huge lot of, <laughs> it's jumping all over the place. Uh, 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 there's a huge amount of research required, I think, to support the consumer in this progressive decarbonisation pathway. Uh, do they go for a heat pump? Can you install a heat pump in a really small property? Does that work? Um, is it a hydrogen boiler? What sort of insulation might I be able to deploy if I live in a really small living space? If I live in a property that's perhaps listed in some way? So there's lots and lots of really difficult challenges. And what we're trying to do is work with academia, work with industry to overcome some of these and find really good solid answers for, for for the domestic user out there. So really excited to launch that. Hopefully by summer we'll be in that position and um, uh, you'll, you'll see more of that uh, through social media and the usual sorts of outlets, I suppose, to say that uh, we're doing that. Also on site, we've got battery storage coming on stream from Northern Power Grid. We've got solar production coming on site. We're working on hydrogen production on site. So we have a fully integrated network of systems all interacting with each other and it's quite an exciting future ahead of us. So really looking forward to having that uh, go live as I say this, this summer. Oh, and that's a little kind of snapshot of where we are today on a soggy, soggy afternoon in the northeast of England. Isn't it a joy? Uh, roll on summer. <laughs> uh, next steps in all of that is to really understand uh, where do we take the site as a, as a whole? Uh, we're really trying to put the, uh, the, the afterburners on the development there. Um, it's, it's all well and good having these little kind of pockets of capability, but how do we join it together? How do we really create this uh, enterprise zone to drive research, drive innovation and, and, and make impact? Um, so you can see some of the ideas that we're pulling together right at the moment. 
uh, you get a sense of uh, where our heads are and uh, you know as, as always if somebody thinks we're wrong I'm always happy to hear about that but we feel that there's some good work to be done in that in those four spaces you can see there um, and this just gives you a kind of sense of uh, where we got to in terms of sketching it out uh, you know we're really driving uh, incubation hubs you know small businesses spinning out the back of academia um, uh, or elsewhere in fact being able to sit within that research facility to amplify their research amplify their technology and get it out in the marketplaces is probably where we're at uh, so lots of exciting areas to look at there uh, I'll not go into that because that's just a little kind of taste of really of, of where we're headed and uh, obviously there's an awful lot of planning to overcome in order to make that a, a reality being in a in a green belt area but really exciting future ahead I think and uh, look forward to talking about this more in the future and I think I'm just about out of time or indeed out of time Rhiannon so I'll, I'll park it there thank you very much thank you Keith um, you were two minutes over, but that is completely fine. <laughs> I feel like that was really, really useful. Um, so now we're going to just open up the floor for any questions. Um, we've had quite a lot in the chat going through um, for both Joe and Keith. So I'll start from the top, uh, which is to Joe during your presentation. Um, what plans, if any, do Manchester Airport have for the use of hydrogen? Um. There are plans. Uh, needless to say, I, I, I think that uh, I would be overstepping the mark if I, if I was to articulate them very clearly at the moment. Let's just say that sustainable aviation fuel will certainly be on their agenda. I think it's known, yes, it is known that the oil refinery, Stanley Oil Refinery, has announced um, its ambitions around sustainable aviation fuel. There is a direct pipeline that currently runs from Stanley Oil Refinery to the airport. So there are opportunities there for SAP at the airport. But I would be somewhat surprised if the airport isn't considering, let's say, the airport logistics at the moment uh, and potentially looking at how it might uh utilize hydrogen to uh to run its fleet off that hydrogen in due course so a couple of different things there Rihanna. thank you very much and i think our second question from dan in the chat also was during your presentation joe um and i think it might link to, to several other elements that you were talking about but um will the ammonia will be produced on site or will this be brought in externally um, so I guess, um, yeah, uh, answer that in, in, in any sort of capacity you'd like from, from the, the things that you discussed. Yeah, so, so the ammonia proposition that Peel Ports have uh, put out there just last week or the week before, if you want to do Peel Ports ammonia, you can see their proposition. It's all around imports. There are clearly amazing propositions emerging around the world at the moment around ammonia uh, and also methanol as well. Uh, I would invite colleagues to look at what's going on down in Chile with, uh, oh gosh, what was the project called? I can't remember. It's on the Mag Magdalen, Magdalen Straits. Um, I would ask colleagues to look at what's going on at Brazil in Brazil at the moment. Uh, there's also uh, considerable uh, developments taking place in uh, Texas and Louisiana. Um, it's shorter from Louisiana to uh, Liverpool than it is to get from Abu Dhabi through the Gulf along the uh, along the uh, Mediterranean into the Atlantic and to come up to Milford Haven. It's quicker to do it that way and it's probably a little bit more secure to do it that way as well, to be honest. I do see uh, considerable propositions beginning to emerge around the UK around ammonia imports or methanol uh, imports, again, over on the East Coast. If you look at Immingham, Immingham have also recently announced their aspirations to develop an import facility there for, I think it's methanol or ammonia. Brilliant. And I think there are some questions uh, for Keith further down uh, and it kind of it might link into what you were saying about hydrogen production on site, Keith. But um, the next question, again from Dan, uh, both of you might have something to say on this, but um, I'll go to Keith first. 
Um, and Dan says, what are the main barriers you see in terms of consent for hydrogen projects? And I think maybe we could talk a little bit about the red car community sort of work that you've done there, although it's been uh, largely positive, you know, there will have been some backlash. So yeah, any, any sort of um, thoughts on that, Keith? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I think there's a, it, there's a broader conversation to be had, um, I think with the public beyond just hydrogen for heat, actually. Um, because it's interesting, whilst whilst I avoid like the plague getting involved in LinkedIn conversations because they go toxic very quickly, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I think there's there is there is something to be said for the concern, be it for hydrogen or heat pumps or any other technology, actually, um, and that. That I think is a reflection of perhaps the lack of quality information out there um, from a, a number of different sources that the, the public can get behind and, and you know uh, consume that information and, and, and understand more effectively why they're being asked to do certain things. Um, so I think that's the broad context. There is absolutely um, a, a position being taken by by some out there that whilst turning around and saying, we don't want to be part of, you know, whether it's the Whitby trial or whatever, uh, uh, we don't want to be part of that. What they're actually saying when you read into the detail is we don't want a hydrogen boiler, but you know what, we don't want a heat pump either, we want to stick with our natural gas boiler. So what's missing there is, you know what guys, that's, that's not an option in the future. There is no do nothing option here. If it's a heat pump, it's a heat pump, it's some other technology, then so be it, be it hydrogen or infrared or, or whatever, but we can't keep burning natural gas in our boilers. Um, so, so I think that message seems to be missing uh, actually from the conversation. And I think that's the first place to start. Uh, so we're always really keen to have that open, honest discussion with, with our, our, our community to say, Look, we recognize this is very challenging. We recognize no one wants change, right? Nobody wants somebody walking through the house and, I don't know, banging in new bigger areas or whatever it happens to be. Um, but we're not, not, none of us have a choice in this because in order to maintain the net zero position and, and, and try and protect the planet, we've got to change. So I think that's really the issue um, to get that material out there. And it sort of speaks to, that wider engagement with uh, the consumer about who is the honest broker in all of this. Because if the power networks say, yay, heat pumps, right? They ain't gonna believe them. If we turn around and talk about hydrogen, they're likely to be slightly uh, uh, skeptical of that because there's that positivity bias that they may suspect we have. Um, so I think it's the question around who is the honest broker in all of this to give straightforward, uh, no spin, information about the choices that are coming down the tracks and i think that's important to try and establish it's something that we've been working on um what is that information how does it look it's one of the things we're keen to try and get through the, the customer energy village to try and test some of this information and make sure that it works so we engage quite closely with national energy action and so forth uh and and readily want to engage with any other community groups out there to really understand the debate and, and to see where we might be able to help with that. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely with uh, Keith on this. Um, you know, there, there are messages there that we we uh, need to get out there and we potentially could have been more on the front foot than we have been. You know, within the northwest of England, we've been producing hydrogen for over 125 years. Uh, we very close to facilities. We consume goods which utilise hydrogen on a daily basis. Uh, potentially, we might even drink quite a lot of it, dare I say. There's a, maybe, no, I'm probably the only person on this call that's old enough to remember Towns Gas coming into my household. And there was quite a lot of hydrogen that used to be in that Towns Gas. So we're kind of going uh, back to the future uh, in, in many respects. Keith's absolutely right. We are in a climate and ecological emergency, so we do need to look for alternatives. We're also in an energy security challenge. So right now, I think we need to back absolutely everything, to be perfectly honest with you. Industry is, there's clearly a demand by industry for hydrogen. 
I mentioned before, NCERC Glass, the largest glass bottle manufacturer in the UK, currently uses a lot of methane, looking to use hydrogen. It will provide them with a new brand to their products, a net zero product brand, uh, uh, brand in, in the future. The development consent order, well, that's gone out through pu for public consultation. It's the local planning applications, which are a challenge. Uh, Keith talked about his hydrogen village uh, sort of facility. We have an amazing hydrogen village uh, facility too. So if ever you're driving along the M56, come and have a look. Uh, it is open to the public and we're doing as much public engagement as we can around that. But the issue of consent is challenging right now. And we may well have to look for alternative ways to get this across the line. But we will need gas in the future. We will need hydrogen in the future. And in, in relation to high, uh, energy security, heat pumps or hydrogen, many people, it seems, don't want either. But we need something. Great. Great. Thank you both. Um, really useful to get both of your opinions on that, actually. Um, I'm conscious of time and we've had quite a lot of questions in, so it may seem like I'm skipping them, but I'm not. We will get answers to, to some of them. Um, so we've got David Simmons uh, has popped in the chat there. What are the teams doing regarding establishing a pricing and load demand profile for hydrogen over natural gas and heat pumps? Uh, now, I will direct that at Keith, uh, but Joe, please, please feel free to uh, chip in. Any questions in, in that? If I pick the demand, the load profile uh, effectively, um, uh, we, we've we been undertaking a lot of work in this space. I mean, it's fair to say, right, it's a gas, it's a gas bottle. If I pick on a domestic boiler, so you've either got a natural gas boiler or you've got a hydrogen boiler. By and large, they're the same device. They've just got different burner technology, blue, uh, gas extraction and flame filling device that's about it really pretty much the same thing same size looks the same on the outside um and guess what its behavior is exactly the same when the temperature drops the burner goes flat out gets you up to where you want to be and then it modulates happy days uh, so actually in terms of difference albeit the volumetric throughput is higher because the energy density from a volume perspective is somewhat less than natural gas the the, the profile itself is is the same profile. There's no real impact there at all. Um, the challenge is the volumetric th throughput. And I, I say challenge in inverted commas, it's just higher, right? Um, when we've undertaken uh, analysis of this, we've got quite sophisticated modeling technologies. By and large, our system's very, very happy to, to, to take that sort of demand. Uh, it's not no real sort of issue. And, and that a lot of that is gains, sounds rather odd, but we, you know, back in 20, uh, 2007, rather, during the financial crisis, there was a, quite a lot of demand destruction across the UK. An awful lot of industry went to the wall. Um, so, you know, on a daily basis, I remember sort of seeing businesses where, right, that's a half a million cubic metres of gas disappeared from our demand profile overnight because they've gone, gone bust, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That was a national pos position. So what it means is our systems that were capable of doing X are now doing X minus because those industries haven't turned. Uh, so, so that ironically affords us some additional capacity in our system to deal with the higher throughput, which is good news, right? Um, uh, which, which is odd kind of benefiting from that. But uh, I think from the from the profile perspective, uh, uh, that's kind of where I would take it. I, I know John's got his hand up, so I'll shut up and let him come in. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, Keith. Very, very quickly, the Northwest Hydro Alliance are just beginning some work to do some work looking at hydrogen demand within the Northwest. We've already done quite a bit in relation to the high net consumption to demonstrate that there is uh, demand there because there's no point having major production facilities if, if, if there's not demand. Uh, we've done a, a fair amount of, of work. Uh, looking at notions of business models in relation to hydrogen costings and levelized costs of hydrogen. So we've responded to virtually every single uh, government consultation uh, uh, that has uh, uh, come out. We're very keen on the whole notion of a levelized cost of hydrogen, almost like a, co a contracts for difference uh, uh, approach to, to hydrogen. Uh, and I'll just finish on this point. It's very clear that the government uh, wants to have 
not well, it's not it's decided it will not use hydrocarbons to produce electrons from 2035. The opposition, uh, Miliband, wants to stop using hydrocarbons to produce electrons as early as 2030. If I look at the moment on Gridwatch UK, about 48% of the electrons produced in the UK that's powering our computers right now that we're sat in front of are currently generated using hydrocarbons. What are we going to do, guys, in six and a half years if the Labour Party becomes the government? or 13 and a half years with the Tories in power, if we don't have something different. And I'll leave it that, uh, that there. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for chipping in. Um, again, conscious of time, but we've got one, two, three, four questions left. So if we don't manage to, to ask them in this sort of time we've got, um, we'll follow up with the speakers, so don't worry. Um, we've got one from Hussein Emily, who says, what are the actions for ensuring the safety of hydrogen for heat at households? Um, so I, I won't direct this uh, at either Keith or Joe, but feel free um, if you've got okay. something. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there's been an awful lot done on this in, in relation to the High for Heat programme, should you want to have a look at that, which Arup oversaw. Uh, Keith's already talked about uh, the Spade Adam facility and what DMV have been doing at Spade Adam. There's a health and safety executive that have been absolutely all over this particular agenda. I'm pretty reassured that, that this is an absolute, uh, it's, 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 it's perfectly okay. Come on, guys, at the moment, we actually consume molecules coming into our houses. As we stand OK, the hydrogen molecule might be slightly smaller, but we've been consuming gas for a long, long time in the UK within our households. We drive around, many of us drive around in cars that carry around a liquid form of hydrocarbon, and we don't bat an eyelid, but we drive around in those particular vehicles. I think it's just a case of uh, slowly but surely nurturing uh, people's uh, to, re to uh, uh, reassuring people. Uh, after all, let's face it, electrons are pretty pretty damn dangerous. If you get a little uh, shock on, off an elect off a, off a spark off, off a plug or a light uh, a light switch, uh, it hurts. So you know both both are pretty pretty can be pretty dangerous if you're not careful. It's all about health and safety. We need to manage people's expectations and how to manage the molecules safely. Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, and I think, um, I mean, just to just to reflect on what we're talking about here is this, what, what you're really looking at, it's a societal risk issue. Um, and it's quite interesting when you start to look at the statistics of societal risk. Um, so, so some of the concerns I suspect are probably born out of the, if you like, the shock and awe that you might get from a major gas incident, right? Because when it goes, it it, it doesn't mess about. Um, but thankfully, these are really quite small events in the scheme of things. And to give you a sense, I've got some statistics in front of me, right? So fatalities per year, that's just, right? it's interesting, isn't it? Number of people that die from a fall, 6,434. <laughs> um, drowning, it's 462. I'm going down the curve, right? We get to electricity at 18, to, to Joel's point. Um, transport and water related 17, transport and air related 17, natural gas five, right? So we're, we're in a really good place, quite rightly. Would I prefer that to be a zero? Absolutely. Um, you know, not, there's huge effort going on to carry out all the research that was undertaken when we moved from trans gas to natural gas and do the exact same research to drive the body of evidence, to develop the standards, to develop the, the procedures, to develop the core competencies and skills in order to make this a reality. And we are wedded to the idea, and, and it's, a, it's an absolute position for the HSE. We, we in the UK, our, our ethos is to drive, the, drive safety into process, not allow through change for that safety position to be diminished. So all the way through this, we're working really hard to make sure that the risk position improves as we move towards this low carbon gas. And yes, there are some differences, and that's, that's at the heart of the research. But fundamentally, we have one gas which is energy rich in order to provide the heat we need, and we're replacing it with another gas which is low carbon but energy rich to provide the heat that we need. 
Um, and it's just about having that science and research and body of evidence to make sure that we understand how to manage that particular change of gas. Thank you, Keith. Um, some very interesting stats uh, that you provide as well to sort of shed light on, on the, the scenario. Um, I'm afraid everyone, we're out of time. Uh, so um, thank you to Keith and Joe for presenting today at our webinar. Um, the questions that we didn't manage to answer in the session, um, I'll follow up with Keith and Joe um, so to get those answers for you. Um, thank you for attending and the recording will be made available on our website. So thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Bye-bye now. Yeah.